Hey guys, Lord Naren White here, the Holy Ghost of the One True God, back with you with the next video in my series reading The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn by Mark Twain. Without further ado, returning to The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn by Lord Naren White. You gave him a chaw, did you? You. So, so did your sister's cat, grand, uh, did your sister's cat's grandmother? You pay me back the chaws you already borrowed off me. Leif Buckner. Then I'll loan you one or two on it. Two ton of it. And won't charge you back. Uh, no, back no interest, neither. Well, I did pay you back some of it once. Yes, you did. About six chaws. You bore a store tobacco and paid back the black man. Store tobacco is a flat black plug. But these fellows mostly chaws the natural leaf twisted. When they borrow a chaw, they don't generally cut it off with a knife, but set the plug in between their teeth and nod with their teeth and tug at the plug with their hands till they get it in too. Then sometimes the one that owns the tobacco looks mournful at it when it's handed back and says it's sarcastic. Here, give me the chaw, and you take the plug. All the streets and lanes was just mud. There weren't nothing else but mud, mud, as black as tar, and nigh about a foot deep in some places, about two or three inches deep in all the places. The hogs loafed and grunted around everywhere. You'd see a muddy sow and a litter of pigs come lazing along the street and wallop herself right down in the way where folks had to walk around her, and she'd stretch out and shut her eyes and wave her eyes whilst the pigs was milking her, and look as happy as if she was on salary. And pretty soon you'd hear a loafer sing out, Hi, so boy, sick him, touch? And away the so would go, squealing most horrible, with a dog or two swinging to each ear, and three or four dozen more a-coming, and then you would see all the loafers get up and watch the thing out of sight and laugh at the fun and look grateful for the noise. Then they'd settle back again till there was a dog fight. There couldn't anything wake them up all over and make them happy all over like a dog fight, unless it might be putting turpentine on a stray dog and setting fire to him or tying a tin pan to his tail and see him run himself to death. On the river front, some of the houses was sticking out over the bank, and they was bowed and bent and about ready to tumble in. Some, the people, had moved out of them. The bank was caved away under one corner of some others, and that corner was hanging over. People lived in them yet, but it was dangersome, because sometimes a strip of land as wide as a house caves in at a time. Sometimes a belt of land a quarter mile deep starred in and caved long and Cave along till it all caves into the river in one summer. Such a town that has to be always moving back and back and back, because the river's always gnawing at it. The nearer it got to noon that day, the thicker and thicker was the wagons and horses in the streets, and more coming all the time. Families fetch their dinners with them from the country, and eat them in the wagons. There was considerable whiskey drinking going on, and I seen three fights. By and by, somebody sings out, Here comes old Boggs, in from the country for his little old monthly drunk. Here he comes, boys. All the loafers looked glad. I reckoned they was used to having fun out of Boggs. One of them says, Wonder who, I, who he's a gwin to chop up this time. If he'd a chawed up all the men he's been a gwin to chaw up in the last twenty year, he'd have considerable reputation now. Another one says, I wished old Boggs had threatened me, cause then I knowed I'd know I weren't going to die for a thousand year. Boggs come tearing along his on his horse, whooping and yelling like an Injun and singing out, Clear the track, thir. I'm on the war path and the price of coffins is going to raise. He was drunk and weaving about in his saddle. He was over fifty years old and had a very red face. Everybody yelled at him and laughed at him and sassed him, and he sassed back and said he'd attend to, uh, to them and lay them uh, out in their regular turns. But he couldn't wait now because he'd come to town to kill old Colonel Sheburn, and his motto was, 
meat first and spoon vittles to top off on. He see me and rode up and says, Where'd you come from, boy? You prepared to die? Then he rode on. I was scared, but a man says, He don't mean nothing. He's always a carrying on like that when he's drunk. He's the best natured old fool in Arkansas. Never hurt nobody, drunk nor sober. Boggs rode up uh, before the biggest store in town and bent his head down so he could see under the curtain of the awing and yells. Come out here, Sherburn. Come out and meet the man you've swindled. You're the out, you're the on after, and I'm a going to have you too. And so he went on, calling Sherburn everything he could lay his tongue to, and the whole street packed with people listening and laughing on. By and by, a proud-looking man, about fifty-five, and he was a heap the best-dressed man in that town, two steps out of the store, and the crowd drops back on each side to let him come. He says to Boggs, mighty calm and slow, he says, I'm tired of this, but I'll endure it till one o'clock. Till one o'clock. Mind, no longer. If you open your mouth against me only once after that time, you can't travel so far, but I will find it. Then he turns and goes in. The crowd looked mighty sober. Nobody stirred, and there weren't no more laughing. Boggs rode off, blackguarding Sherburn as loud as he could yell, all down the street, and pretty soon back he comes and stops before the store, still keeping it up. Some men crowded around him and tried to get him to shut up, but he wouldn't. They told him it would be one o'clock in about fifteen minutes, and so he must go home. He must go right away, but it didn't do him no good. He cussed away with all his might, and throwed his hat down in the mud and rode over it. And pretty soon away, he went a-raging down the street again, with his gray hair a-flying. Everybody that could get a chance at him tried their best to coax him off his horse so they could lock him up and get him sober. But it weren't no use. Up the street he would tear again and give Sherburn another cussing. By and by, somebody says, Go for his daughter. Quick, go for his daughter. Sometimes he'll listen to her. If anybody can persuade him, she can. So somebody started on a run. I walked down street a ways and stopped. In about five or ten minutes, here comes Boggs again, but not on his horse. He was a-reeling across the street towards me, bareheaded, with a friend on both sides of him, a holt of his arms, and hurrying him along. He was quiet and looked uneasy, and he weren't hanging back any, but was doing some of the hurrying himself. Somebody sings out, Boggs! I looked over there to see who said it, and it was that Colonel Sherburn. Sherburn. He was standing perfectly still in the street and had a pistol raised in his right hand, not aiming it, but holding it out with the barrel tilted up towards the sky. The same second I see a young girl coming on the run and two men with her. Boggs and the men turned round to see who called him, and when they see the pistol, the men jump to one side, and the pistol barrel come down slow and steady to a level, both barrels cocked. Boggs throws up both of his hands and says, Oh, Lord, don't shoot! Bang! Goes the first, Bang! Goes the first shot, and he staggers back, clawing at the air. Bang! Goes the second one, and he tumbles backwards onto the ground, heavy and solid, with his arms spread out. That young girl screamed out and comes rushing, and down she her throws herself on her father, crying and saying, Oh, he's killed him! He's killed him! The crowd closed up around them, and shouldered and jammed one another with their necks stretched, trying to see and people on the inside to shove them back and shouting, Back! Back! Give him air! Give him air! Colonel Sherburn, he tossed his pistol onto the ground and turned around on his heels and walked off. They took Boggs to a little drugstore, the crowd pressing around just the same, and the whole town following, and I rushed and got a good place at the window, where I was close to him and could see in. They laid him on the floor and put one large Bible under his head and opened another one and spread it on his breast. But they tore up open his shirt first, and I seen where one of the bullets went in. He made about a dozen long gasps, his breast lifting a Bible up when he drawed in his breath and letting it down again when he breathed it out, and after that he laid still. He was dead. Then they pulled his daughter away from him, screaming and crying, and took her off. 
she was about sixteen, and very sweet and gentle looking, but awful pale and scared. Well, pretty soon the whole town was there, squirming and scourging and pushing and shoving to get to the window and have a look. But the people that had the places wouldn't give them up, and folks behind them were saying all the time, Say now, you've looked enough, you fellows. Tain't right, tain't fair for you to say all that time. And give, never give nobody a chance, or other folks has their rights as well as you. We'll go ahead and stop there for this week. As usual, I want to say thank you for watching, and I hope you enjoyed. Please like, comment, and subscribe, as it greatly helps the channel. Like to be with you all. Thank, thank you. Take care, and thanks again.